Uh, the next thing we are going to talk about is the coronavirus elements of this budget. It was you know, pitched as, as the government's response to coronavirus, both to, I suppose, bring about the conditions whereby people can stay in their homes and take time off work so that they don't pass on coronavirus to other people, but also to keep the economy rolling. And we're going to talk about you know, the extent to which coronavirus looks like it will cause a massive economic crash in this country and all over the world. First of all, here are the announcements that were in that budget uh, relating to coronavirus. So you have £5 billion emergency response fund to support the NHS and other public services in England. Uh, all those advised to self-isolate will be entitled to statutory sick pay, often not enough, uh, even if they have not presented with symptoms. So before they were saying you have to be ill before you get sick pay. Now, if you've been told to self-isolate, you can get sick pay as well. Uh, Self-employed workers who are not eligible will be able to claim contributory employment support allowance um, and employment support allowance benefit will be available from day one, not after a week as now. Always seemed a bit odd to me why you have to wait a week anyway, whether or not there's coronavirus around, people have to you know feed themselves in that first week. Uh, £500 million hardship fund for councils in England to help the most vulnerable in their areas. Firms with fewer than 250 staff will be refunded for sick pay payments for two weeks. That seems quite a good one because it means that, you know, you, your small business owner shouldn't be pressuring you to not call in sick. Small firms will be able to access business interruptions and loans of up to £1.2 million. So that'll be, you know, if, if businesses have to shut down for a couple of weeks, they might not be able to pay their bills. And business rates in England will be abolished in retail, leisure and hospitality sectors with a rateable value below 51 grand. So that's, you know, a little bit of support to small businesses so they can survive whatever shutdown they have to do during, you know, the coronavirus spike. Some of these measures, obviously good, important. There's been a lot of conversation around sick pay and when it will start to kick in for people. These are good things. It doesn't change the fact that the amount of sick pay that we get in this country protected by law is shit when you compare it to the rest of Europe. And when you have such terrible sick pay provision, you are actively disincentivizing people from staying at home when they're sick because plenty of people are looking at a straight choice between paying bills, food on the table for my kids, or staying home and looking after the collective health of the population. For most people, needing to feed their families will win out. And I think that when it comes to how we imagine public health measures in this country, I think 40 years of neoliberalism has done a lot to corrode the idea of a collective subject. So the idea that sick pay isn't an entitlement, it's a public health measure. Or indeed, things like elderly social care, not an entitlement, it's a public health measure. We've got 6 million carers in this country who are caring for one of their relatives. A third of those carers are themselves over 65. Now, my grandma lives with my stepdad and my mum because she needs more care now that she's older, you know, cooking meals, company, help with various tasks. Let's say my mum on the true back gets coronavirus, gets the fever, blah, blah, blah. And so she takes the advice to self-isolate. She self-isolates in a house which has got someone who's over 80 years old in it. Let's say she's able to effectively self-isolate within that house. And so the whole order of who uses the bathroom and blah, 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 all of that goes fine. When you have an elderly relative in the house who needs care and needs to be cooked for and needs to be helped around to move, it's not as simple as that. And we created these conditions by not having a proper social care system in this country. <clears throat> um, and so it just, it seems to me that yes, the Conservative Party have to some extent turned on the taps when it comes to borrowing, but it's all entirely reactive and short-termist. The idea that you need to build these institutions which are universal and that will make for a more resilient and healthy population is absolutely nowhere to be seen. So I suppose we should also know actually that this morning the Bank of England reduced the interest rate from 0.75 to 0.25, so that was 0.25% and that was, was coordinated with the government to try and 
give a big it, signal it that the matters. government is going to be there to keep the, it, the economy going. It barely going. matters. There's a sort of signaling effect in the base rate reduction. They've also offered, um, they've extended the term, uh, was it, the term funding scheme and, and some support for businesses uh, over the next few years, basically making it cheaper to borrow to get through periods where they can't necessarily meet the demands made in them in terms of cash uh, because nobody's buying anything because they're all locked in the houses or supposed to be locked in the houses. This isn't going to be adequate. Um, is is the first thing to say in it. Uh, the provision that's been made for statutory sick pay, I think, is is farcical because Britain has what, around about the lowest, the second lowest uh, level of statutory sick pay relative to average wages out of any European country. So that's already bad. The fact it's been extended the first day, it should never, ever not have been uh, the first day. And by the way, one of the things we have to say when this has presumably uh, died down somewhat in three, four months' time uh, is that these things ought to remain in place permanently. Uh, the provision for if you're self-employed, which is not statutory sick pay, it's getting forced onto some of the other forms of benefit that are out there, are, are not adequate. The a provision overall is not enough to deal with the, the scale of the crisis that we're running into. And it's important to get the, the fundamental of this, of this one. The COVID-19 uh, disease is caused by a virus which is exceptionally, uh, really exceptionally transmissible uh, between people. It is very, very infectious. Significant Significantly above, it would seem, uh, the SARS epi uh, epidemic of 2002-2003. Significantly above, as far as you can tell, things like Spanish flu epidemic in 1918. Certainly above uh, what normally we get as the sort of seasonal flu and this sort of thing. And that's bad when you also then have not so much that it kills lots of people. It, it doesn't. It kills people who are susceptible to it. They have some pre-existing condition. They're elderly, this sort of thing. The Fatality rate in, in uh, Hubei in China is 14% is if you're over the age of 80. It is quite seriously bad if you're elderly. It's quite seriously bad if you have some pre-existing condition. And it's pretty bad for everyone else because a large number of people end up with some acute condition where you need treatment. That's the point at which, as you see happening in Italy, your health service gets overwhelmed with a load of people who need to have really quite intensive care. Now, Britain does not have a particularly adequate supply of uh, intensive and acute care, I should say, uh, beds. Well, it has one of the lowest out there. Every winter. Exactly. And already, if you look in London, uh, acute bed usage is around about 90% throughout the NHS. Now, you know, you take Germany, it's about 23 acute uh, care beds per 100,000 people. In this country, it's about six. European average is something around eight, right? Mm. So Germany's very well provided. We are very underprovided. So that overwhelms the existing health system once you get large numbers of people with the disease. That means one of the things you have to do and one of the things that should already have happened is uh, the government should, in fact, have told people, this is what's going on. You need to self-isolate immediately. Here is the financial assistance to make sure that you can do this because it's no good saying to people, uh, work from home or something. If you can't work from home because you're supposed to be in a shop or a factory mm. or wherever it might be. It's fine if you have a relatively white collar job and go and sit at home and tootle around the internet. It doesn't seem too bad. We've seen this in China, by the way. The class division in this is striking. The way it reinforces inequality is striking. If you're reasonably well off, you can sit at home, order deliveries, whatever it might be, and like, okay, what two are the So in, Ch in China, when they told people to stay at home, for example, or mm. you know, physically stop them from getting to their jobs, did they provide benefits for those people when they're at home house? I, I haven't read much the, about the, this. The, the the Chinese benefit system is, is frankly underdeveloped at best and is a very, very large informal sector. So you end up with a large number of people who, who are really in quite a dire situation as a result of basically being told you have to stay there and you can't go to work, right? And that has been very, very strictly enforced, which in a sort of epidemiological and healthcare sense is like one way to solve this. The reason it's so strict is because the, the, the virus is so infectious. Uh, and so you have to be pretty extreme in how you monitor and control for it. Now, you can be less dramatic than that. Part of what's happened in China, you also see it happening in South Korea, is that you try and monitor where people are going. So the second stage of this thing is not just control. You stop people moving around. You try and trace where they've been. And then you sort of monitor that. Now, that can be a very sort of intrusive process of working out pe where people have got to. Did anyone see uh, the announcement this morning that... Of course, Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson mm. invited in the tech companies to go and like <laughs> have yeah. a nice gathering and work out what everyone's doing with this. And this is, by the way, one of the things that comes out of this the other side is that suddenly we have a far more intensive uh, surveillance through our mobile phones, through everything else we do than we're used to as a result of this. But that is part of potentially how you try and uh, deal with some of the problem of people wandering around. You need to trace who they talk to because it's infectious. So you have to trace where the virus has got to because you can't control it as effectively as you would like on quarantine alone. Uh, we've been talking now about how measures in the budget might be inadequate. There also was one measure slipped in there 
uh, that's gone largely unnoticed, which is, is not just inadequate, but actively harmful to this country's ability to deal with coronavirus. Uh, it is related to the surcharge that migrants have to pay to use the NHS, even though they already pay taxes, so it's, I mean, it shouldn't exist in the first place, uh, but it has been increased. So for adults, the surcharge was £400 a year to use the NHS. It's gone up to £624 per year. For children, uh, it was £300 and it's gone up to £470 per year. This is bigger than a 50% increase. It's massive. Um, and EU migrants who didn't have to pay it before will now have to pay it. So, so that's it will have a lot more people new... having to pay for their own health care. It will have to be for new EU migrants. As far as I can tell, it's not yeah. going to apply to people who already live in this country. Now, it's not the case that you've got to pay £620 when you go to the hospital because you got drunk on a trampoline and you broke your leg. It's something that you have to pay as part of the visa mm -hmm. application process. But where that does totally fuck our healthcare system and therefore our resilience when it comes to things like coronavirus or indeed anything else that's going on with public health is that it disincentivizes migrants from coming to this country and working in the NHS. We have a huge staffing so shortage of nurses and doctors in particular. You've got a huge staffing shortage uh, in the social care sector as well. Now, faced with that staffing shortage, and it's not the case that we have this, you know, horrendously uneducated population and all you have to do is train up more British doctors and nurses. I mean, one way in which you could do that is make, by making tuition free. Um, it's because... We have an aging population. You have an infrastructure which needs to be staffed properly. And who is going to want to come to work in this healthcare system if you have to fork out 620, 620 pounds for the privilege? It's insane. I'm going to bring up an article now. So this was in Bloomberg today, this morning. Uh, the headline was, Keep calm and wash your hands, Britain's strategy to beat the virus. Uh, God, I hate I'll, this I'll, I'll so read much. out the first two yeah. paragraphs. So it says, while China quarantined 56 million people and the whole of Italy is on lockdown to counter the spread of coronavirus, the UK <laughs> is taking a radically different approach. Instead of keeping people inside their homes, Boris Johnson's government is trying to get inside their heads. Shunning headline measures like travel restrictions and quarantines to focus on a more banal task, finding ways to persuade people to wash their hands. This advice that the government is taking about how to deal with coronavirus is from the Nudge Unit. It's something that was created in, in 2010 by David Cameron, the idea. It was all part of his big society uh, where you you make the state a bit smaller and instead of having you know active government policies, you just have a small unit that tells people to do stuff on social media. So they're, they're the unit who, who encouraged people to get... Or, or, I, I get them quite a lot, those texts that say you still haven't done your tax return, you still haven't done your tax return. Maybe you could try to do it tomorrow. So instead of like staffing HMLC to, you know, enable Answer them the to phone. investigate yeah, yeah, yeah. and audit and collect taxes from huge corporations, you've just got Michael Walker's phone pinging. To be fair, all of those texts minutes. do actually make me do my tax return on time. But, yeah, I but, the issue but is, maybe you should wash good, your hands. It's but, good enough for getting you to do your tax return, but is this an approach good enough But does it make Philip Green pay more for, of his no. tax? Does it make Richard Branson pay more of his tax? Does it make, you know, Jeff Bezos pay more of his tax? Talk, the, 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 Only the, Michael Walker, and, sorry babe, but... You're Brokey McBrokerson. Well, it's also a big it's also a big risk when it comes to a public health or a potential public health disaster, right? To hope that you can just nudge people into washing their hands enough. It, it seems to fatally underestimate the sort of basic biological problem of this particular virus, this new novel coronavirus, which is that it is, it is exceptionally infectious. That is what makes it worrying. And it's that, that awkward balance with a virus where it's very infectious, where it doesn't necessarily kill too many people. And it's kind of, you know, you can wander around with it for quite some period of time without any symptoms. So it spreads very rapidly. And the problem isn't that most people get it and therefore they die. It's not Ebola. 60% of people who get Ebola die, right? It is absolutely lethal and horrible and immediate, but that's why it doesn't spread very fast. This one, you get it and you wander around a bit and you meet your friend and they go and visit their grand, their grand gets it and they maybe die. That's the problem with this one. So the idea that you sort of nudge people a little bit to wash their hands slightly more, the idea that you just sort of make these minimal interventions and by the way, make those interventions rather too late in the day and this gets us through this, I think is absolute nonsense. We're, we're probably, what, two, three, four weeks away from having to do things like Italy is doing at this point in time. And that's kind of the rough mm. sort of path we appear to be heading down. And, and that does mean suddenly... You have to tell people to stay in their homes. You don't go out too much. I mean, one of the things which I think is incredibly 
alarming about the coronavirus outbreak in the UK is that I do sometimes feel that our media culture is uniquely stupid mm. and irresponsible when it comes to uh, covering it. So I cannot tell you the amount of times I've been, you know, texted by a producer who's asking me to come on the news specifically to talk about coronavirus. And I'm like, look, much to the disappointment of everyone, not least my mother, I am not a medical doctor. <laughs> this is not my job. It's one thing for if it comes up in conversation on some kind of panel show for me to go, oh, okay, these are some of my observations, but hey, don't take my word for it. I'm not a fucking doctor. And another to have your opinion deliberately sought out to talk to the public on something which you are not not qualified to talk about it's it's so so irresponsible and then you add to that but it does come up in some of those panelly conversations i have heard the most batshit things you would not believe i was doing like a late night paper review on the stephen nolan show on uh, bbc5 live with lance foreman who is a former brexit party MEP and quite sincerely he was like well I'm not an expert in these things but I've heard that Wuhan is a center for biological weapons testing in China so I wonder <laughs> no. if that's got something to do on, with that on radio but wow he said it completely <laughs> unchallenged you you know seeking out Nigel Farage's opinion what's Newsnight thinking this is not the time for any rando with a big gob to just hold forth you know even on some of these like you know sort of morning you know breakfasty show things i definitely heard people saying like oh well you know you should stock up on loo roll because the chinese are putting all their resources into making face masks now i have no idea where they got that from all i know is that in sainsbury's and superdrug and tesco's and little you've got people alligator wrestling for the last role of andrex and that doesn't seem to me to be a particularly responsible media culture but this is this is a, a failure of government communication from the off like why are people panic buying loo roll i mean the, the, there is a horrible logic to panic buying which is that you have to panic buy because everyone else is panic buying otherwise the thing you want to panic buy runs out and of course you doing that means everybody else has to do it so this is all self-confirming logic it's like a bank run you have to go to the mm. bank to get your money out because everybody else is doing it you have to buy loo roll because everybody else is buying loo roll but there's no real reason to do this and your list of symptoms of, of what uh, you know, COVID-19 will, will give you. I mean, mostly it's like a fever and, and a dry, we were just talking about this, and a dry cough. Uh, somewhere down the line, it's like organ failure and like diarrhea and stuff. But basically, your loo roll isn't going to help you much at this point. So why on earth everyone thinks they have to run off and do this is not quite clear. This looks to me like, by the way, a failure of government communications. Mm. It should have been made very clear much earlier on that these are things it will do, these are things it won't do, and this is what you might need to do to deal with it.